Well, welcome to the first Sunday in Lent. Here's a bracing thought to start off your Lent, uh, aimed uh, mostly at older folks. <clears throat> Phillips Brooks was a renowned clergyman who preached at uh, Trinity Church in Boston in the late 1800s. And he was preaching on a, a passage in 1 John, which says, the pride of life is not of the Father. And of that passage, Phillips Brooks said this. He said, a great deal of what passes as goodness as men grow old has nothing to do with holiness, but rather to do with simple aging. Many a man passes, who passes for a sober, conscientious, religious sort of man at 55. If you put back into his cooled blood, the hot life he had when he was 25, he'd be the same reckless, profligate, arrogant sinner that he was then. It's not the pride, it's the life he's lost. Just some food for thought. In the Bible, the sin of pride is considered the mother, the fountainhead of all other sins. According to the prophet Isaiah, pride and sin was first made manifest when Lucifer, the magnificent worship leader of heaven, first set himself up on his own throne in opposition to God. So God cast him out of the third heaven. Then in the Garden of Eden, Lucifer successfully tempted our first parents to be like gods. This resulted in the fall of mankind, so that all creation is now infected with sin. The Lord Jesus, he had no pride. He was meek and lowly in heart. He emptied himself of his divine prerogatives. In the ultimate act of humility, he became human. Augustine, Aquinas, and Dante all characterized pride as the worst sin of the seven deadly sins. Synonyms for the word proud include arrogant, boastful, being puffed up or self-centered, narcissistic, haughty, vain, and insolent. Pride refuses to be dependent on God or to be subject to him. Pride exalts the self, saying, I'm self-made. I'm above the rabble. I have no need of others. Pride puts the self in God's place and denies that we are creatures who are dependent on God for absolutely everything. It's a sign of how far America has drifted from our Christian heritage that arrogance and boasting are now considered admirable by many. In athletic contests, I remember the time when it was considered unsportsmanlike to preen in victory and to exalt over your adversary. Now we expect it. We even regulate it. Politics is no better. Whatever you think of Presidents Donald Trump and former President Barack Obama, neither man is known for his humility. To put it mildly. Yet many people seem to admire this condescending attitude as long as it is their champion who has it and not the other guys. In the book of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon is a textbook case of political pride. You could say he came by it honestly. He is a true alpha male, unlike any of <coughs> um, our presidents, at least since George Washington. This king was no armchair general sitting in an office or at the rear of armies. He led his armies from the front lines into battle against his foes. He was a brilliant military strategist. 
he subdued everything from Egypt to Persia. He himself laid out the plans and built the city of Babylon, the largest city in the world at the time. He built a wall around this city that was 60 miles long and was so thick that they used to have chariot races on top of the wall. He commissioned the hanging gardens that became one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. In the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar says, is not this the great Babylon I have built as my royal residence by my mighty power for the glory of my majesty? As soon as these words about I have built Babylon by my mighty power and the glory of my majesty passed his lips, the true and living God spoke to the king. God told him that Nebuchadnezzar would go insane. He would lose his authority as king. He would think he was an ox and eat grass with the beasts of the field for seven periods of time, probably seven seasons. This would last until he acknowledged that the Lord God was sovereign and God gives kingdom to whom he wishes and God can take it away. That was a divine smackdown for pride. See, God humbles the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. Pray that God give you grace to humble yourself so that he will not have to humble you. If you look at your life and say to yourself, Look, look at what I've done. I did it all. I did it my way. You know that song by Frank Sinatra? That song is the most popular, the most played song at funerals around the world. Yes, I did it my way. That is pride. If you're a success in the world's eyes, it's easy to think that you are where you are in life because you worked harder, because you studied longer, you worked smarter, and you took thoughtful risks. And from there you can say, well, I deserve the good things that I've received. You deserve a break today. So get up and get away. Come to McDonald's. That's when things are going well. But when things are not going well for you, when you suffer reverses in your finances, when you have health issues, when you suffer reverses in your relationships, and you say to yourself, you know, I deserve more. I deserve better than this. This just is not fair. My life is harder than other people's. Well, if you find yourself in that place, that's also a sign of pride. Because it's all about you. Now contrast pride with humility. So there's a, there's a deadly sin, pride, and there's the corresponding virtue, which is humility. And humility is a distinctively Judeo-Christian virtue. Other religions do not prize humility. The ancient Greeks did not prize humility. Humility sees all of life as a gift. The humble person knows that they deserve nothing, and that all they have is a gift from a gracious God. You see, if God gave you what you actually deserve, you'd be lost. You'd be poor. 
You'd be wretched. You would be eternally separated from a holy God. The truth is that God has been good to you. He sent his son to rescue you. He gives you food to eat every day. He gives you shelter to keep you warm in the winter and even cool in the summer. He's placed you in the richest county, in the richest country that the world has ever known. All this is only by his mercy. It's only by his grace. If you see all of life as a gift, then every day, it's a new surprise. You can't wait to open this new gift. You know that you don't deserve it. Let me ask you this question. Is there anyone here in this nave who really thinks that you deserve all your blessings? I'm reminded I, in my daily Bible reading, I, <clears throat> I read through the book of Job, which even though chronologically in the Bible it's later, uh, it was written, it's probably the, the first book written, and so it, it uh, has already come up in my daily readings. And uh, at the end of, of the book, after Job makes his complaint to God, God asks him questions like these I'm about to ask you. Did you pick the century in which you were born? Did you pick the country of your birth? Did you pick your parents? your early education? Did you pick your intelligence? Did you pick your genetic tendencies to disease or wellness? Well, of course not. You, you couldn't choose those things. You had zero control over them. Nebuchadnezzar was born a prince. His daddy was the king. God blessed him with his with the ability to accomplish all that he was able to. But when Nebuchadnezzar became convinced that he had done all of this through his own power, God made sure Nebi got the message by humbling him rather dramatically. Many people struggle with suffering and they wonder why God permits it. Why is it that the innocent suffer? Well, this is an age-old question. There's no easy answers. But one reason is that one reason that people have a difficult time with this issue is that they tend to assume that the world is worse than they deserve. Of course, in one sense, it is, for you and I were made for heaven not for this fallen world. But when Christ rules in your life, you come to see that the world, your circumstances are instead and indeed far better than you deserve. Which does not mean that we don't weep when we're in pain. Of course we do. We weep over our pain, we weep over the pain of others. We weep when the innocent suffer, like the children involved in the school shooting in Parkland, Florida, and their families. Christians have no easy answers to tragedy, but we do know that but for the grace of God, there goes my school there goes my children, there go I. If you are suffering today, if it is you, if you're in the place, know that Jesus Christ, he knows all about your suffering. We do not serve a God far off, but a God who's come near and remains near 
and knows intimately about suffering. He died an incredibly painful death on the cross so that you and I could be redeemed, so that we could live an abundant life now and with him forever. He suffers right now along with you, comforting you as you suffer. If you assume that the world is better than you deserve because you're humble and you know that everything that you enjoy is a gift, then you'll be able to handle suffering with much more grace and peace. Now let's turn to the parable uh, Jesus tells in, Ma in Luke chapter 18, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, those um, epitomes, those paragons of pride on the one hand and humility on the other. Remember, the Pharisee didn't really pray. Instead, he delivered a report to God of his good behavior. God to him is a passive audience whose job it was to applaud when the report was complete. The Pharisee turned prayer into occasion for his own self-exaltation. He says, thank you, God, that I am not like other men, extortioners, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes on all I get. Do you hear the refrain, I, 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 I? The Pharisee has eye disease, and he cannot see his own self aright. For all we know from his prayer, the Pharisee thinks he has no needs, that he's done nothing wrong because he doesn't ask for anything and he doesn't confess any sin. Jesus tells us that the Pharisee wanted to justify himself. But of course, that cannot be done, no matter how holy you are. The Pharisee, he fasted twice a week. The prescribed frequency for fasting among the tradition of the Pharisees in that time was you fast once a week. So he was just so pleased with himself that he was fasting twice a week. Well, the story goes that a Sunday school teacher read this same parable to her class and concluded by saying this, now children, let us all thank God that we are not like that Pharisee. When you finish chuckling to yourself, ask yourself if you were just for a moment taking comfort that you're not like the Pharisee or like that teacher. This kind of thinking can become an endless loop, which has been called the comparison trap. It's so easy to compare ourselves to others to come up smelling like a rose, isn't it? On some level, our fallen human nature, we all do that. But comparing ourselves to others is a trap because your self-image and your head can get overinflated like a cheap balloon. It's a trap because you can get caught into a pattern of behaving in which you have to put down someone else in order for you to feel okay. Beth Couget calls this the victim-victimizer pattern. You see, if we have been victimized, often we will turn to make others a victim too. The cycle of child abuse through the generations is just one example of that same pattern. Of course, church people do this too, even pastors. I have heard ministers put down other ministers behind their backs so that most of what they communicate about the other pastor is a put-down. That's a critical spirit. 
And it's a sin against both the people named and against the body of Christ. I confess that I have struggled with that sin in my own life. Comparisons also a trap because we can use those comparisons either to exalt ourselves on the one hand or to debase ourselves on the other. Through comparison, you can put yourself down so much that you convince yourself that you're worthless, not worthy to be in the company of God's people, too sinful to even assemble yourself. Nothing could be further from the truth. No matter what you've done, I mean no matter what, if you come to God and humble yourself, say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, you will be justified, you will be welcome among God's people. Comparison is helpful only when we compare ourselves to God's standards. Can I hear an amen? amen? Now that tax collector, let's look at him. That archetypical extortionist, traitor, collaborator with the Romans, when he came to pray, he said only this. He said it, let's say it together. Can you put it on the screen, please, Abby? God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let's say it again. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said the man who prayed that, even though he was a profligate and gross sinner, he was justified by God and not the Pharisee. So Jesus concludes, he says, he who humbles himself will be exalted, but he who exalts himself will be humbled. Beloved, humble yourself so that God need not humble you. I went through a time of pretty intense humbling in my own life. I'm something for, uh, someone for whom Things, uh, most of my life just came easily for me. I was good at school. I was good at sports. I had lots of friends. Things just went well for me. And God called me into ordained ministry, and I went through um, the process, the long, involved, painful process uh, toward ordination. And uh, so I was at Church of the Apostles at the time in Fairfax, and Apostles was one of the uh, theologically conservative churches, in the Diocese of Virginia, the Episcopal Church, which was dominated by liberals. <clears throat> and um, for uh, the four people who had gone forward for ordination before me uh, never made it through the process at the diocesan level. But uh, I made it through the process at the parish level, and they recommended me, and then we went to the diocesan level where there was something called an ordination committee. And they vetted me and said, yeah, you, we believe you have this call. And so I went to seminary, and uh, I had, uh, you know, I continued to practice law at the same time. I spent three years in seminary, and, um, and then uh, halfway through, well, actually, just about the end of my third year, I had to come before this group called the Standing Committee, and the Standing Committee had no expertise in matters of uh, ordination. Uh, they were simply a political body that was elected from all of the delegates at the diocesan synod. And so that was dominated by liberals, but they, many of them weren't used to dealing with conservatives. Um, so I came, but I was pretty confident that I would get through because things had gone well so far. <laughs> and uh, after I appeared before them, they brought me back into the room and informed me that they were halting my process toward ordination that I would be on hold until I dealt with the pride that so clearly had infected my life. Until I dealt with what they considered 
the, um, the unresolved issues that I had around my parents' alcoholism. And so I went away with my tail between my legs and I sought to um, learn humility. They had humbled me and now I needed to humble myself further. So I picked up Andrew Murray's book called Humility. So I, um, I, I picked up another book called Step Down with Jesus. I studied about how I could be the most humble person in the world. <laughs> Not only that I could be the most humble person, but that I could convince this group of people who didn't particularly like me that I was the most humble person in the world. You see the irony there. How do you prove that you're no longer proud? You can't. I was powerless. So, but I came back six months later, and I um, uh, came before them. And somehow, by the grace of God, they decided, well, I guess you can go ahead anyway. So I was ordained. And you know, I had some anger about that episode for some time. It took me a couple of years into it before I began to, I think, truly appreciate what a gift these people had given me. I saw it in political terms, but really it was about God using these people who in some ways were my adversaries to refine me for the glory of God. God will send you people who aren't really on your side to help refine you and become the man or woman that God is calling you to be. Bill Stafford, in his book, Disordered Loves, the seven, Healing the Seven Deadly Sins, which is still on sale out in the bookstore, and I highly recommend because I'm rereading it, and it's just so good. I really want to encourage you to pick it up. He says that it isn't the disciplines one chooses, but rather the humiliations that God sends that are the most effective antidotes to pride. I can tell you that that has been true in my own life. There was a time, uh, she doesn't do it anymore, but there was a time when my wife suggested it would really be good for me to let her edit my sermons. She called it the humility edit. It wasn't until later that um, I, I learned something from Bishop John that was really, really helpful. He said, Clancy, you can preach about yourself and what God's doing in your own life. Just take my advice. Don't ever make yourself the hero of your own story. So yes, God will humble us if we do not humble ourselves. Even so, we can cultivate humility. Here's how. Every day, deliberately set aside time to thank God. Thank Him for all your blessings of that day. Thank Him for the food that fills your belly. Thank Him for the roof over your head. Thank Him for those who love you, who surround you. Thank him for whatever estate you find yourself in. Thank him that you draw breath this very day. When you do that, you remind yourself that everything you enjoy is a gift, a gracious gift from a loving God. So does thanking the people around you daily. Husbands, when was the last time you thanked your wife? Wives, when was the last time you thanked your husband? I mean, really stopped to look in their eyes and thank them. Another thing you can do is you can praise God. Whenever you're tempted to praise yourself, 
Turn your eyes to Jesus and praise his holy name. Flip on the radio, your Sonos, your Spotify, whatever it takes, and praise Almighty God. Praising God blunts self-praise. Another way that you can be reminded that this life is not your own is you can pray daily. Pray along with our devotional, Seek God for the City 2018. We have more of these. If you haven't yet picked one up, they're available on the way out, and you can download the app, which I encourage. A final way that the church encourages us to observe a holy Lent is to serve the poor and the lonely. If you may be called to that ministry, we can get you plugged in. Just ask one of the clergy. Well, if anyone gives himself to any great and noble cause, he moved toward humility. Let me ask you this. Do you have a great and noble cause that you have given yourself to? Have you given yourself for country or family or liberty or equality? My father did on the battlefields of Italy in World War II. So there, while there are many ways that we can move toward humility through a great and noble cause, there's only one cause that is greater and nobler than any of these. Of course, that is the cause of Christ and his cross. Jesus was the only humble man who has truly ever walked the planet Earth. He held back nothing, giving his life on the cross so that we could live the abundant life now and that we might live forever with him. Think about the incarnation going from majesty as God in heaven to become a man would be like you or I becoming an ant or a snail or a cell of slime. Giving yourself wholly to Christ ought to be our grateful response for all he has done for us. When you see the weight of your own sin, when you see how great your salvation is, when you come to understand what you truly deserve, then your gratitude will well up in you and you will be humbled at your great salvation. I hope that none of you are too proud to cast all your cares and be completely dependent on God for everything in your life. Jesus Christ is our example, and he was wholly dependent on his Father for everything. Remember, he said, I only do what I see my Father doing. He derived his life from the Father. He's submissive to the Father, and he is our pattern. So if you would be saved from the pride of life, all you need to do is repeat the simple prayer of the tax collector. Next slide, please. Let's say it together. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. If you're tired of being a slave to your own ego, if you're tired of being a slave to your own ambition, if you're tired of your own dissatisfaction with life, then say this prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus is the only worthy master. His, his ambitions, his hopes and dreams for your life are the only ones worth following. Anything other than his gospel and his service is the pride of life. And the pride of life is death. So let's pray.